Hey yo, it's that old Yorkshire geek here, and I'm just here on a Sunday with a uh, just a quick news update. Just a few things that caught me eye. Just I think just three stories: two Star Treks and the Spider Man. So let's get on with it. So where's my window? There it is. Bloodush. Patrick Stewart says Star Trek Picard season three, the Next Generation reunion isn't a walk down memory lane. Oh, it's just a vanity project. I bet they're barely in it. Patrick, Sir Patrick, I scolded him on um, <laughs> on Twitter the other day, and he hasn't blocked me yet. He's probably not read it, <laughs> telling him what I thought of Star Trek Picard and about it being a vanity project, and it's very sad, because Patrick Stewart is a national treasure, particularly for us Yorkshire folk. <sighs> but Star Trek Picard is bloody awful. Anyways, so I'll read. I shall read to you. In my Yorkshire Sunday best. Season 3 of Star Trek Picard is bringing back the main cast of Star Trek The Next Generation for what promises to be a, quote, proper send-off. Little is known about the upcoming season, but now star Sir Patrick Stewart is talking more about bringing back his TNG co-stars for the finale season. Stewart took convincing to bring back the TNG cast. Well, yeah, because he didn't want them in it originally, did he? He just wanted it to be about him, about Picard. Because, as I said, it's his vanity project. And they had to persuade him to have Riker and um, Troy in season one, didn't he? Were there any others? There were a couple of others, weren't there? There were Hugh, but he wanted a main cast thing, were in Seven of Nine, but she were on Voyager. But anyway, right, last month, Paramount Plus revealed... By the way, in the UK, we're getting Paramount Plus in June which means we can legally watch <laughs> uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds in June in the UK. Uh, I've already seen the pilot episode and my review, not pilot, the first episode. They don't do pilots anymore, do they? they just get on with the series, do they? Um, which is a shame. Uh, I miss, does anybody miss uh, feature-length pilot episodes? Because they don't do them anymore, do they? They used to do like a little film, to kick off a TV series, which was the pilot, and if that did well, it would move on to a series. And and if it didn't do well, it had, you, they'd use it just as a standalone movie. And some of them got cinema releases, particularly you know in Europe and, and I think Australia as well. But they don't do it anymore because, you know, I'm a, I'm a boomer and I live in the old days. And we're going to come to that again later with the Spider-Man story. But anyway, right, last month... Paramount Plus revealed LeVar Burton, Michael Dorn, Jonathan Frakes, Gates McFadden, Marina Sirtis and Brent Spiner will all be joining Stuart in Season 3 of Star Trek Picard. But no, um, Will, no, Will Wheaton, because he were in Picard, wasn't he? As Wesley Crusher, the Traveller. God, I hate that man. With his smug, bloody, what, gerbil face. It's like... It's like Dave Lister off Red Dwarf with his, you know, gerbil-faced optimism. God, that pig in him. <laughs> anyway, and in the last week, we have learned that most of the original cast of Picard is exiting the series ahead of season three. Yay! And Gates McFadden has revealed she's at least, in at least, uh, six episodes, which is good. Because I like Gates McFadden. You know, she was super attractive when she was in uh, Next Generation. Uh, met her at a convention once. She wasn't shaking hands, she was doing fist bumps and she had lots of um, um, hand wash <laughs> on the on her table. So I don't know. Read that into that what you will. But I saw her recently on the uh, is it Centre Seat 50 Years of Star Trek. She were hosting that and she's she's looking at it. She's had some work done. Let's just let's just leave it at that. She's had some work done. But anyway, um but who am I? Who am I to criticise? I'm just a, a slobby, fat Yorkshireman with long hair and glasses and manky teeth. <sighs> so it is becoming clearer that the TNG cast will be the big focus for season three. Speaking to Variety, Stuart wouldn't confirm exactly how many episodes each of his TNG co-stars will be in, but he did reveal how they will be spread throughout the season, which is a shame I wanted them all to be together, because they were talking you know, in the voiceover that we saw in the little trailer thing for season three. I think it was Riker, wasn't it, saying they were going on a road trip, and so you thought they were all going together. I thought they were going to go back in time. I thought Picard were going to leave him a message 
from 2024 and they were going to go back in time to save them. But no. Q got his powers back somehow and sent him back to the future. Spoilers. Anyway, uh, so Patrick Stewart says, right, uh, that is a question I can't answer. I'd do, do it in his voice, but I can't. Yeah. That is a question I can't answer, but every single one of my leading colleagues from Next Generation will be in Season 3 at different times. Sounded just like him, didn't it? <laughs> Before agreeing to return for Star Trek Picard, Sir Patrick Stewart told executive producer and co-creator Alex Boo Kurtzman he wasn't interested in going back and recreating the next generation. No, because he wants to be all about Picard, doesn't he? And in his variety interview, because he's got a massive ego, I mean, you've got to have really to be a, a leading man in Hollywood, but bloody hell, Patrick. Uh, Stewart explains it took convincing to get him to sign on to bring back the TNG cast for the final season. It was something which oh, not his voice. It was something which initially I had my doubts about. It would seem to me that it would be paying too much attention to the fan appreciations of what Next Generation had meant to them. I know how intense the social reconnections uh, can be, but when we talked about it, when I talked to Akiva Goldsman about it and my fellow producers uh, and other writers. Uh, I could see that it could be done without rewinding the clock. There was no reason for us to walk down memory lane in every scene, not at all. And the brilliant thing the writers did in season three is that they engaged the cast of Next Generation, but that's as much as I'm allowed to say. Speaking to The Hollywood Reporter, Stuart had this to say about what it looks like to be reunited with his TNG co-stars. We have been bonded together for years and years in different ways and for different reasons. I adore them and I love them all deeply. What they brought into my life in 1987 was rich and complex. They all are as committed as any group of actors I've ever worked with. And really, hardly, <laughs> most of them have hardly had any work since, have they? And yes, we had a lot of fun and we joked. But nevertheless, we were a serious group of actors and I was so proud of the work that we did. Saying goodbyes in season two. In his uh, Hollywood Reporter interview, Stuart talked about the emotion of saying goodbye to some of the actors as they wrapped up season two. I watched the episode for the first time this room, this morning and I was so deeply moved by those scenes with John Delancey and the content of those scenes because he was making himself as a character vulnerable. John can bring complexity to the simplest line. I mean, I mean that as a compliment. I'm envious. His whole attitude and the things he was saying and his gentleness and sensitivity, it choked me up. And then we came to the moment when Borg Queen Alison Pill took off her mask. <laughs> it looked awful. We had this curious, he's going to try and um, justify it now and explain it. We had this curious angle shot rather low into her face, looking up into her eyes. I'm afraid I began to weep. It was so touching because, of course, it meant that I was saying goodbye to John and to Alison, who are both wonderful actors, you know, with a superimposed face, which looks crap. Because I don't think the, it was originally meant to be uh, Gerati. It was supposed to be his mother, probably. Cause, but they do that in, in Kurtzman Trek. They change the direction of the story partway through the season. I don't know why they do it, but they do it regularly. They did it in Discovery a lot. Anyway, uh and that's the, uh, the executive producer, Terry Matalas. I know it's Matalas, whatever. She had a behind-the-scenes video for John Delancey's final scene with Stuart, with Delancey thanking and hugging Stuart and thanking the crew. I won't play it because we'll get a bloody copyright strike, but uh, the link will be in the description box below. While we're at it, don't forget to like and subscribe and share the videos and use the notification bell if it's there. I don't even, if, even know if it's there. Um, and, and, and all that stuff, you know, just just support the channel if you like what I do. Uh, in addition to Stuart, the only other members of season of the season two cast who are confirmed to be back in season three are Michelle Hurd, Raffi, and Jerry Ryan Seven, Captain Seven of Nine now of the uh, Stargazer. Unbelievable. The pair will be doing a live Twitter Spaces event on Monday. Uh, and there's a tweet about that. And that video is unavailable. There's no word yet on when the third season of Star Trek Picard will debut. It'll be next year sometime. Uh, or it could be back end of this year. You never know. 
but I imagine it'll be next year. It, apparently, it's in the can. The oh, crack, my, my voice broke then. Um, it's in the can. The the finished filming and there's it's in post production now. They'll be doing all the effects and all that stuff and superimposing faces. <laughs> Uh, and it's all done. I suppose there'll be some uh, ADR and all that. Post-production, as I said. So there you go. TNG, they're going to be spread out across the season. So will we see them all together? Is that, are they going to do um, a Star Wars sequel trilogy and not have the original cast all together at the same time? <sighs> On the Millennium Falcon. I mean, they should... Uh, pull the Enterprise E out of mothballs and have them playing that Riker and that. They should steal it like Kirk did in Star Trek Three when he stole the Enterprise. They should go to, uh, oh, where is it? That uh, uh, Starfleet surplus depot where they put old starships. The, uh, at, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the planet. But uh, they should go and steal it from there if it's there. Or it might be destroyed. I don't know. I haven't kept up with the... Uh, the books and the online, Star Trek Online and all that, I don't know. But whatever. Uh, so there you go, so that's that one. Right, next up, Strange New Worlds. I really enjoy Strange New Worlds, I have to admit. The first episode, I really liked it. It's not perfect. I did have a lot of niggles. If you watch my review, um, you'll see I've got a lot of nitpicks about it. But for some reason, I liked the, the quite like the story. It was a, a good traditional Star trek type story. The cast were really good for the most part. And that elevated it. And that made all the nitpicks not really matter because they were kind of minor. Apart from, I didn't like the scene with uh, Spock and Tipring on Vulcan. As adults, we know from you know Star Trek lore that they never met. Between the ages of Spock being seven and him in a mock time, him and T'Pring never met. So they were betrothed as children in a, like an arranged marriage and uh, they never met until a mock time in the original series. So they buggered that up, didn't they? But apart from that, I really enjoyed it. Go and watch my review, if you don't believe me. <laughs> anyway, right, Star Trek, Strange New Worlds. I know you can't see the full... Um, Thing. Hang on, there we go. I'll move it across. Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Will we see the gone? Will we see the gone? Sorry, it's like a song title, doesn't it? <laughs> Can you feel the force? The original series told us that Starfleet's first encounter with the vicious, go villainous gone, but the vicious as well. Um, oh, sorry. The original series told us that was Star Trek Starfleet's first encounter with the villainous gone. But there are hints that we might see them on Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Right, I'll move you back over there. There we go. Uh, and there's the Gorn, the Gorn Captain fighting Captain Kirk. And uh, it was awful, wasn't it? It did look terrible, but uh, whatever, it's cool. This article contains minor spoilers for Star Trek Strange New Worlds Episode 1. Yeah, because the Gorn are mentioned in Episode 1. Spoiler alert. Uh, even though they do cover it. Even though the first time we see the Gorn, um, and I think it's the first time like Starfleet has, has directly interacted with the Gorn, is in um, Arena, the original series episode Arena, where Kirk fights you know the captain of the Gorn ship. Um, but obviously the Gorn had been around before that, and we did see him in Star Trek Enterprise in uh, the Mirror Universe. So we saw him in that in a CG. I will, I'll show pictures of that in a moment. But I'm going to read this first. Right, Star Trek is a franchise with a massive legacy. Uh, one of the newer series on Paramount Plus are gleeful to explore. Gleeful. The problem that rears its head and stops a lot of fun possibilities can often be encompassed by a single word: canon. What had been previously established in a movie or TV episode to many should not be explicitly contradicted. Almost from the start, Star Trek has had a spotty relationship to its own canon, but generally most of the shows have gone out of their way to maintain it. Yeah, it's never been perfect. Uh, the original series and Next Generation and DS9 and Voyager and Enterprise, they've never been perfect with, you know, keeping keeping into canon. But they've tried for the most part. Um, but shows like Discovery and Picard have flagrantly broken canon and they've seen like not to care 
they just do it all the time. So that, that's the difference. That's why shows like Discovery and Picard, and um, in, in my opinion, I don't know if it broke canon, but I just didn't like the show, Lower Decks. Um, can't say much about Prodigy because it's not really Star Trek, is it? But that's why those shows get a lot of backlash from you know Star Trek fans, uh, the, the the Star Trek fans who are really serious about canon. Uh, obviously, there's some Star Trek fans that you know don't care and they just enjoy watching you know the keys jangling and stuff. And I'm like that, you know. I like a good space battle and all that and the fist fight and stuff. But you've got to try and stick with the law. And if you can't stick with the law, try and explain why you're breaking canon. Um, I mean, Enterprise did it. They showed Klingons in the first episode of Enterprise, Broken Bow. They showed Klingons with forehead ridges. And everybody was saying, why have the Klingons got forehead ridges? That's not canon. And then for three years, for the next three years, uh, they kept showing Klingons with forehead ridges. And the fans you know, kept saying, but they're not like that. Well, they shouldn't be. And then in season four, they showed, they explained how the Klingons lost their forehead ridges for a while. What, for about a hundred years, didn't they? And then the, uh, well, no, more than that. Um, by the time Next Generation comes around, it'd be like nearly 200 years, won't it? Um, it was a, an augment retrovirus that caused them to uh, lose their forehead ridges and they eventually got them back. After a couple of generations. Anyway, where were we? Uh, a classic example was in Star Trek Enterprise's use of the Romulans. In their first appearance in the original series, it had been established that no human had ever actually seen a Romulan. That meant in Enterprise, set around 100 years before the time of the original, uh, the, the original series, no human character should lay eyes on a Romulan. The show went out of its way to keep this consistent, despite featuring several Romulan appearances. It took a lot of work, but canon was mostly respected. Star Trek Strange New World is seemingly trying to do the same thing with the Gorn, one of the franchise's most popular alien races. The Gorn first appeared in the original series Season 1 episode Arena, where a member of the species did battle with Kirk. It was established in that episode that this was the first time the Federation had ever met the Gorn. This would seem to preclude the idea that Strange New Worlds, set before the time of the original series, could encounter everyone's favourite reptilian baddies. Uh, right, well, on, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. Unlike Enterprise, Strange New World seems to not to be sticking with this piece of canon. Now I'll explain why well, that's not quite true in a minute. The Gorn form a key part of La'an Nooni and Singh's traumatic, trauma, traumatic backstory. If you really want to stretch the notion that we haven't seen a Gorn yet on screen and maybe Singh never full-on saw them, then maybe this is mostly adhering to canon. Executive producer Akiva Goldsman, however, teases that the writers are less concerned with canon in this case than you might think. We are really big on canon, but at a certain point we will interference with it. Interference? What? what? Has it been snorting Coke, Coke again? Coca-Cola? Coke again, I don't know. With it in order to tell a good story he tells us. The lure of the gone was too much to pass up. Gold, Goldsman describes the race as a really, really great enemy for whom we have no compassion. An enemy who might be pure evil in Star Trek's world, where we correctly have empathy and compassion all the time, an actually evil adversary. The potential of the gone to Goldsman trumps anything previously set down by the original series. This may anger some fans, but we'll have to wait and see what Strange New Worlds does with the Gorn in the future. Could we see a Gorn in the scaly flesh by season's end, or will they stay in the shadows? Now, in the first episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, um, we learn that Lahan, Nooni and Sink, spoilers by the way, uh, Lan Nooni and Singh, as a child, her and her family were on a colony ship, so it's not necessarily Starfleet, it were a colony ship, uh, they were headed out somewhere, and they were attacked by the Gorn, and the colonists were taken to a Gorn um, ha hatchery planet, um, and they were used as, uh, you know, birthing sacks and food and stuff for the, the, the hatchlings, and only La ah, Noonien Singh survived, but only because she was the last one alive. And in the Gorn tradition, they set a, a drift in, a, in a, a space raft 
and she was picked up by um, a starship, a Federation starship that had um, number one on, Una, Una Chin Riley, who were an ensign at the time. Uh, and then she joined Starfleet, did uh, La Arnunian sing. But and anyway, um, that's the backstory. Uh, but we see uh, Pike reading up, uh, reading La Arnunian sing's file, and it mentions the Gorn that the Gorn had attacked her um, colony ship. But in in brackets next to Gorn, it says unconfirmed. So that's you know a thing that fair enough. She said, they've only got her word for it, basically, haven't they? Um, so it's unconfirmed to Starfleet that uh, the Gorn attacked the colony ship and she was the only survivor and all that. So it's, yeah, maybe they did, they probably believed her, but it's it's unconfirmed. So that, that keeps that canon, you know, in canon. But we'll have to see what happens, won't we, later on in the series, if we see... The Enterprise doing battle with the Gorn and fighting with the Gorn face to face, uh, then that that'll break canon, won't it? Because that supposedly has not happened, unless they do a discovery and decide not to talk about it ever again. But there you go. Uh, speaking of the Gorn, let's have a look at one. Right, so that's a Gorn from the original series when he used to go all. <laughs> And then when they redid the, uh, <laughs> um, when they redid the uh, for the, um, oh, what did they call it? Remasters. The uh, when they did redid the uh, special effects with CG and all that, they made him blink, didn't they? And it still looks stupid. Still looks stupid and slow. And here is the gone that we saw in Enterprise, the CGI gone, which isn't great. I've got to admit, it doesn't look very good, does it? And it didn't walk very well. It was very clunky. So we'll see what uh, Strange New Worlds does with the Gorn. Will they make it more... Because it looked more dinosaur-like in Enterprise. Um, like I say, obviously, in the original series, it was a man in a rubber suit. Um, so it just looked like a man in a rubber suit. Um, but it was more like a dinosaur. I think it actually... Did it have a tail? I can't remember if it had a tail in... Uh, in uh, Enterprise, but it, you know, it had, it had weird dinosaur-like legs. It didn't have legs like um, we see in the original series. It had, uh, you know, the dinosaur-like legs. Uh, so anyway, we'll see. We'll see what happens, won't we? So that 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 kind of worries me because I did enjoy Episode One of Strange New Worlds, and I'm worried that it's going to go downhill, like Picard did. That season two, first episode, you know, were, were quite good. and um, But then it, it just went downhill rapidly, didn't it, after that? Right, my last story for today is Spider-Man. The Spider-Man score from Sam Raimi's film coming to vinyl after 20 years. 20 years after the original film's debut, Danny Elfman's score for Spider-Man gets an exclusive vinyl release, including limited edition variants. And I'm mentioning this because I'm a boomer. I'm that old. York. When I say old, I mean it. That old Yorkshire geek. I like vinyl. Even though I've got a crap record player, that uh, it plays me old records. Great. But get a brand new one on these supposedly great 180 grams. Pardon me. Or whatever it says, 180 GSM. I don't even know what that means. Um, you know, vinyl records. And they jump all over the place. Most of them. Some of them don't. Um, I've got an LP by Hammerfall, brand new one. That played perfectly. I've got one recently by Walkings. I'm into metal, by the way. I'm doing the horns. You can't see, but I'm. Uh, and that jumps all over the place. So I ended up listening to it on YouTube. <laughs> But that's by the by, that's my problem. Right, the original score from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man is finally getting uh, a vinyl release after 20 years. Uh, sorry, 20 years after the original film's... Oh, God, I can't read properly. It's because it's Sunday and because I'm thick. 20 years after the film's original debut, considered, considered one of the most influential superhero films of the modern era, 2002's Spider-Man saw Tobey Maguire cast as the film's titular web-slinger alongside Kirsten Dunst's Mary Jane Watson and Willem Dafoe's Norman Osborn slash Green Goblin. As of last year, the film still ranks as the 37th highest gross grossing film in the US and Canada. 
and it held the record for the highest grossing superhero origin film for 15 years until it was finally beaten by 2017's Wonder Woman. Ooh, that's a surprise. I thought that Avengers had beaten it, but uh, obviously not. Sony Music Soundtracks have announced via Twitter that the film's soundtrack will be released on vinyl pressings featuring the original it's expensive, featuring the original score created by renowned music legend Danny Elfman. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of what it the Simpsons or it Family Guy. It was Family Guy, wasn't it? In one of the Star Wars ones where the Killed John Williams and so the, to get Danny Elfman into to do the score for the Star Wars thing, and it was good. But anyway, in addition, <laughs> the soundtrack will also be available in special limited edition silver and gold variants, which will also feature foil lettering on the covers. Cool. <laughs> that was a bit of sarcasm. These exclusive variants will be limited to 5,000 individually numbered copies in the US. Check out their original tweet below. It's individually numbered. I mean, it'll be written in marker pen. You know, they'll actually have somebody writing it on. I doubt it. Uh, and there's the tweet. Uh, da, 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 da. Just saying the link and links to order it. I bet it's expensive. I'm not going to click the link. It might say on. No, it doesn't. This release is good news for fans as serious collectors alike and old people like me. And it also comes at an opportune time considering Raimi and Elfman's latest collaboration. Was it Elfman that does um, Doctor Strange? Anyway, while the duo would re-team for 2004 Spider-Man 2, Elfman's role of 2007 Spider-Man 3 was instead fulfilled by composer Christopher Young. More recently, however, the pair teamed back up to provide the original score of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Serious collectors and fans of their original work on Spider-Man had best get in quick, with the album variants strictly limited. And that's it. Can we click on one of these and see how much they are? Uh, we'll do the black one. I'll open the new new tab. Right. Pre-order. Right, it's on Amazon. This is in America. $30. What's that in Britishness? I don't know. Uh, it's not actually too bad, is it? I don't know. Will it be about... I don't know, we'll have to do a conversion, won't we? Let's do a conversion. Currency conversion. See, we're working on the fly here. We're working on the fly. Right. Uh, I forgot what it said. Uh, 29.98. We'll go the other way, aren't we? There we go. Uh, 29.98 is... Oh, it's £24.30. pence. It's actually, it's actually quite close out the pound and dollar at the moment. I mean, they used to be quite far apart, but... Uh, so that's for the... I think that's for the, the normal LP, you know, the black vinyl one. So let's see how much more the silver and gold ones are. $35 for the silver one and the gold one. Probably the same. Yeah, yeah. Is that the gold? Is the LP going to be gold? Oh, it is the picture there. Look, yes, the LP is gold. And in that one, the LP is silver. And in that one, it'll show it. It's black. There we go. Yeah, so there you go. So that's if you know for lovers of vinyl. I bet they skip all over the place. <laughs> you can get your hands on them. Uh, coming soon. Did it say when? I forgot. But whatever. So that's it. That's the news I've got for today. Just a quick one again. Um, so there you go. There you go. Uh, so don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, share the videos. Uh, tell all your friends about that old Yorkshire geek. This doddery old fart who stumbles over his words and gets things wrong all the time. But it's just a bit of fun. Uh, so don't forget to like and subscribe, share the videos, use the notification bell, and wherever you are in the world and the galaxy and the universe beyond, look after each other. And until next time, I'll see thee.